Hello, and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today, we're taking another look at everyone's favorite Jawa cosplayer, Father Casey. In this video, he answers questions that people have about a subject that he's not supposed to be familiar with, sex. The questions run the gamut and touch on a lot of topics, from homosexuality to masturbation to who you're allowed to wink at, and more. Also, apropos of nothing, the Catholic Church has started using a mascot in order to lure children back to the church, which seems like a bad idea given their reputation. And I seem to be in the minority on this one, but I think that thing is creepy as fuck. Like, just look at her. She's got some Cthulhu-looking monster in her eyes, and you can't tell which direction she's looking because what the fuck is even supposed to be her pupil in those abominations? And that's not even getting into the fact that her boots appear to be soaked in the blood of her enemies. Just gives me the willies, man. Like, am I wrong here? Anyway, let's get on to the video. Hello, Internet. My name is Father Casey Cole. I'm a Franciscan friar and Catholic priest, and today I'll be answering your questions about sexual ethics. Because, you know, the most qualified people to talk about the nuances of sexual ethics are, of course, the people who are supposed to remain virgins for their entire lives, but keep getting caught perpetuating some of the most heinous violations of sexual ethics. I'm not saying that Casey is one of the perpetrators of said violations, but he's literally an apologist for an organization that has worked hard and spent lots of money in a massive effort to sweep those violations under the rug and make sure that the actual perpetrators get away with them. Can't wait to see the comments on this one. Glad he's self-aware enough to realize that his pontificating on such a topic is, at the very least, problematic, but unfortunately he's not self-aware enough to have realized that he should probably just, you know, shut up about it. Why is same-sex activity immoral? It's not. Y'all just don't like it. Like, seriously, when you break it down to just a boring description of what it actually is, it's two people physically touching each other in a way that feels nice. That is, at its core, what all sex is. Homosexual, heterosexual, romantic, casual, two partners, larger groups, whatever. It's people doing things that feel nice. And aside from the social taboo that's attached to sexual acts, it really isn't all that different from non-sexual activities that feel nice. When I go for a massage, the person massaging me is providing me with physical touch that feels nice. Yeah, the type of nice feeling is different between sexual stimulation and non-sexual physical touch, but it's a bit of a blurry line. So why are some nice feeling touches horrible, sinful acts, but others are just fine? What is the actual difference? Okay, obviously with the massage there is a difference. If I had an orgasm while on the table, I probably wouldn't be allowed back there. Well, depending on the kind of massage provider I'm going to. And that kind of proves my point. The fact that the rub and tug industry even exists serves to demonstrate the fact that being touched just feels nice, and there's not a huge difference between sexual nice feelings and not sexual nice feelings. To be clear, I am not advocating for being creepy during a typical spa massage that is not supposed to have a happy ending, using the blurriness of the line as an excuse. Self-control is a thing that exists, and if you have difficulty with such basic self-control as would be required there, you probably just shouldn't go for non-sexy massage. This is actually a great one to start with, not just because it's the most relevant and most controversial today, but because it helps shed light on the entire Catholic framework for sex. Honestly though, why is it relevant or controversial? It shouldn't be any more relevant or controversial than heterosexual sex. As we'll see later in the video, unmarried heterosexual sex is supposed to be just as bad as homosexual sex, so why is it less relevant or controversial? For us, all things have a purpose for being created and an end to fulfill. For sexual activity, there are two such purposes. To bring life into the world, and to bring a couple deeper into a covenantal union of love. And homosexual sex fulfills both of those purposes just as well as heterosexual sex for a couple that is infertile for one reason or another. Ergo, it's fine. The reason that same-sex activity is not permissible is the same reason that masturbation, pornography, sex before marriage, artificial contraception, threesomes, and a host of other things are not permissible. Okay, I get that you had to phrase the second thing as a covenantal union of love in order to shoehorn the Catholic definition of marriage in there, and so that does take some of those things out of the picture because they definitionally don't have that covenant backing them up, like masturbation or premarital sex. But what about threesomes? If a married couple are brought closer together through having a threesome, and are open to the threesome producing a pregnancy, then does that not bring a couple deeper into the covenantal union of love? You could even argue that the third person isn't sinning either, because they are facilitating the couple in deepening their covenantal union of love. 
So while they may not be having that covenantal union for themselves, their sex act does still result in the two purposes that you said sex was for. So that should be okay, should it not? Loopholes are fun. It fails to meet one of the two ends. For a sexual act to be moral, it must be at least open to procreation and loving in nature. So I get that you saying it has to be open to procreation is your way of getting around the fact that infertile heterosexual couples don't meet the criteria that you laid out, leaving you looking like massive hypocrites for being accepting of infertile heterosexual couples, but being bigoted against homosexual couples for not being able to make babies. But the thing is, your loophole here doesn't actually work. There are plenty of homosexual couples that absolutely would be open to sex resulting in new life. And you believe in a god of miracles, do you not? Could he not miraculously make the occasional homosexual union produce a baby if he wanted to? It's not like their chances of conceiving are any different than a heterosexual couple where, say, the woman had a hysterectomy. The equipment for making babies just isn't there in both cases. So their openness to having babies actually becomes rather irrelevant. But even if you say they have to be open to that idea, why is that valid for infertile heterosexual couples, but not homosexual couples? When it comes to nudity or sexual content, where's the line between art and pornography? There is no line. Pornography is the highest of art forms. It gets bigger when I pull on it. Hmm. Sometimes I pull on it so hard, I rip the skin. Well, my daddy taught me a few things too, like uh, how not to rip the skin by using someone else's mouth instead of your own hands. Will you show me? I'd be right happy to. It may surprise some to realize that many old churches and even Catholic museums contain works of art depicting nudity, and that the church has no problem with this. Tell that to Pope Paul IV, the guy who mandated that private parts be covered with fig leaves in art in the 1500s. In reality, the church loves the beauty of the human body and the wonder of sex. These things should be lauded and lifted up. They just only love those things in contexts that they control. Hence the eight minute video by an ostensibly celibate man pontificating about how other people need to behave in the privacy of their own homes. The problem comes when these things are cheapened, exploited, or exaggerated for the sake of arousing the viewer. And who decides where that line is? I made a joke a couple weeks ago about someone starting a Wikifeet page for me because you could briefly see my feet when I got up on my soapbox. Side note, a bunch of people commented that there isn't a Wikifeet page yet. Anyone can create one of those, so it's just because y'all are being lazy. Anyway. That led to me actually visiting Wikifeet for the first time, and I was shocked at just how not pornographic the vast majority of the pictures are. In fact, they have a strict rule about not showing nudity other than feet, so you'll never see a naked boob or a dick or a vulva or a butthole while you're there. It's just pictures of people with their feet visible. People like myself who are not into feet will see those pictures and say that they are not pornographic at all. But the whole reason that site exists is because there are people for whom just a bare foot is pornographic. And different people are going to have different thresholds for when an image or video moves from artistic to pornographic. And even with something that you would think is quite clear, like actual sex acts complete with penetration, there is still a line between art and porn. There are movies that are not considered to be pornographic, but which depict explicit unsimulated sex. And they often do so in ways that are not really conducive to arousing the viewer. I think a good example is the movie Short Bus. It's a movie that has a bunch of intertwining plots, but if we focus on the main character's plot, it's about her quest to experience an orgasm for the first time. The fact that she hasn't yet is a source of ironic embarrassment, as she is a sex therapist. Throughout the movie, you see her and the other cast members in a number of explicit scenes, which, while being obviously real, are not shot gratuitously. And when she finally does have an orgasm, despite the context being that she's in a threesome when it's happening, the only thing you see is her face. Now, setting aside the fact that this movie is depicting sex acts that Casey disapproves of, can you really call it porn? The intention of the writer is that it was not pornographic. It wasn't shot like a porn, but the internet is the internet. I guarantee you it's been used as porn many times over. So hypothetically, if a similar movie were made that only depicted heterosexual married sex and the actors were actually married, would that be acceptable to you as a form of art? Who is the arbiter of what is art and what isn't? Art is a rather subjective topic, is it not? And what about art that is so bad that it's good? I, for one, enjoy terrible movies, and I'm not alone. There are movies that have cult followings specifically because of how bad they are. There are movies like Plan 9 from Outer Space that are being permanently preserved thanks exactly to how bad they are. 
People like me keep them around to be viewed and enjoyed when they would otherwise be lost to history, as so many movies from that era already have been. And ultimately, is that not what makes something art? For people to want to see it, to enjoy it for its own sake, because they appreciate it? Like, I, I know I used that clip from that weird gay porn earlier as a joke, but that specific gay porn is more well known even among the straights, specifically because of how hilariously bad it is. People watch the non-sex scenes because they enjoy them for their own sake. So as much as I joked about it being art, it actually kind of is. At this point, it ceases to be about glorifying the subject, it becomes all about gratifying the viewer. Well, by that definition, the intention of the artist is the only thing that matters when defining art. So Short Bus, even if many people have used it for self-gratification, is art because the people who made it explicitly intended for it to be artistic and not pornographic. Personally, I'm not a fan of that definition, though. I think art belongs to the consumers of art rather than the artists themselves, though the intention of the artist is certainly something that can be taken into consideration when evaluating evaluating art, but it is not the be-all and end-all. In general, I recommend asking three questions. What is the purpose of the work? What is the amount of discretion used? And what effect does the work have on the subjects themselves? What do you mean, what is the discretion used? Is that just your fancy way of saying that a depiction of actual intercourse is not allowed because it's not using enough discretion? What about the erotic poetry that's in the Bible itself? Sure, it uses euphemisms rather than just saying, they fucked, but there are blowjobs, cunnilingus, a harem full of Solomon's other queens and concubines, and more. It is quite explicit, there is no question about that. So does the fact that it calls testicles bags of myrrh make it discreet enough to pass your arbitrary test? And if these three criteria are an all or nothing thing, then I got some bad news for you about the effect the work has on the subjects themselves, by which I actually think you mean the consumer rather than the subject. In the case of the Song of Solomon, the subjects of the poem are most likely fictional. The existence of Solomon himself is a matter of debate, but as the book is likely a collection of poems written over a period of centuries and compiled sometime in the Hellenistic period, likely the 3rd century BCE, it is extremely unlikely that any of the characters have any basis in reality. As such, the subjects of these poems are not people whose lives will be impacted by the existence of the poems. Same goes for modern fiction. The people that Fifty Shades of Grey is about do not and never have existed. So there are no subjects whose lives would be impacted by the existence of those books. So what do we do with that then? This last one is rarely considered. So I guess he does mean the subjects of the work itself rather than the consumers? Okay. So what if a heterosexual cis couple who are married and Catholic have an exhibitionism fetish, so record themselves and post their videos to a porn site? In this case, they are strengthening their relationship through their sharing, and as long as they are open to pregnancy, that fits the definition of permissible sex that you just gave, does it not? And if they do it with artistic intentions, then it doesn't matter if people on the internet end up using it for their own self-gratification. It is art that seeks to celebrate the beautiful sexual union that God designed. There are just so many loopholes here, even with their overly strict definition of what counts as acceptable sex. And don't think that there aren't people making use of them. Back when I was a good little Christian boy, I thought of at least some of these loopholes then, and so there was a time when I tried to find porn where the performers were married. Because then their sex wouldn't be sinful, you see. And while I'm not even going to attempt to find it now, one of the websites I wound up on was a blog of a Christian couple who posted pictures of themselves having sex in what they considered to be an artful way in order to do just what I said, celebrate the beautiful sexual union that God designed. I would be surprised indeed if they were the only ones to have ever thought to do that. I'm a Catholic and also asexual. What, if anything, does our faith teach on this with regards to marriage or sexual activity? Paul was pretty clear that aces are the preferred sexuality above all others. That's the whole reason why Catholic clergy are supposed to remain celibate, after all. 1 Corinthians 7, 8 through 9 says, To the unmarried and the widows I say that it is good for them to remain single, as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. I mean, at no point is it ever explicitly said in the Bible that priests cannot marry, but this, combined with later verses in the same chapter and a command from 2 Timothy that soldiers of Christ do not get entangled with civilian pursuits, is where the Catholic Church gets the idea that priests shouldn't be married. But hey, I'm not actually here to argue about Catholic doctrine. I think they probably have less of a problem with sexual abuse if they didn't insist that all of their ranking officials be sexually repressed. But my point is that God wants everyone to be an ace, according to the Bible, which is really fucking weird when you consider that one of the common arguments against homosexuality from Christians is that if everyone became homosexual, humanity would be extinct in a generation. Also worth mentioning is that there are degrees of aceness. 
There are asexual people who do have sex for various reasons. Everything from wanting to please a partner who may not be asexual, to feeling the need to clean the pipe, so to speak, even if they get nothing from the act itself, and several points in between. This is all irrelevant, but given that Casey is unlikely to bring any amount of nuance to the table in this discussion, I thought it was at least worth mentioning. Also, the aces get excited when people acknowledge them because they are frequently the neglected stepchild of the LGBTQ community that everyone just forgets about, so I like to go out of my way and give them that acknowledgement when I can. I like making people happy, so why would I not? It's easy. Love you aces. As far as I've read, and I could be wrong on this, there isn't much at all specifically about asexuality from the Catholic Church. Likely because they figured it meant people who don't have sex and don't want to, and since they're all about restricting sex, they didn't feel the need to say anything about it. I'm not sure if this is because the Church doesn't recognize it as a legitimate state of being, or because it's still fairly a new concept, but there just isn't much there. No, oh, nice how you're leaving the door open to the possibility that being an asexual person just isn't a legitimate state of being. Seriously, Casey, can you just stop to think about how it might feel to have someone look directly into the camera and say that something that is inherent to who you are and which you have no control over is not a legitimate state of being? You're just heartless. What I will say, though, is that sex is an essential part of marriage, and so if someone feels no sexual desire towards their partner, it can't really fulfill what a marriage is intended for. Why? Is there a problem with having a romantic relationship without sex? Isn't that what you think all romantic relationships are supposed to be before marriage anyway? Do you really not think that there's any difference between being married and dating other than sex? This seems a bit reductionist, don't you think? You can be partners and friends and support one another, but it's just not a marriage. Why the fuck not? What if they want to adopt a kid together, get the tax benefits that come from being married, be recognized as married by the government so that they can have things like hospital access? Or maybe they even just want to have a little ceremony where they pledge their love for each other publicly and then have a party with all their friends afterward. Why is all of that invalid if they don't want to have sex? It's funny, as an atheist, I have been accused many times over of leaving the church because I want to sin, usually with sex being brought up as the obvious sin that I want to do, with people accusing us atheists of obsessing over sex. But I'm not the one that's reducing marriage to the concept of penis go in vagina with everything else about marriage being invalid without that one specific act for some reason. Luckily, the church does not require marriage, and in fact, both Jesus and St. Paul hold celibacy as a greater choice for those with this gift. Maybe it's just a gift that you have. And this is where I'm going to push back on my own statement from earlier that the Bible actually prefers you to be asexual. The way it is written, it doesn't talk about how living without the temptation of sex is preferable. It's about how it's preferable for you to resist the temptation of sex. If you are asexual, the temptation usually isn't there in the first place. So you're not resisting temptation, you're just existing as you are. Also, remember, asexual does not automatically mean aromantic. There are plenty of aces who want romantic relationships. And as already mentioned, if they end up in a relationship with someone who is not asexual, they may even want to have sex with that person. Not from a desire for sex within themselves, but from a desire to please their partner. But either way, I don't see why you would deny someone romance just because you don't think they'll have sex if they get married. I mean, I guess there's that antiquated idea of consummating the marriage, but like, why does a marriage not count without sex? And hell, even among Catholics, what counts as consummation is a matter of debate. Well, trying to find out why consummation is so important to Catholics, a fruitless endeavor as it all essentially just comes back to God said to make babies and nothing more, I ran across a disgusting paper published by the Catholic Medical Association that argues against the idea that it is morally permissible for a married couple to use a condom to prevent HIV from passing from one of them to the other. They conclude their paper with an analogy. If someone with a skin condition that makes it intolerable for them to touch water is baptized, but only through a protective plastic sheet that stops them from actually getting wet, and both they and their priests fully intend this ceremony to be a baptism, are they really baptized? My gut reaction was obviously yes. An all-powerful and all-knowing God surely wouldn't punish someone for having a skin condition that he gave them. But the paper concludes with a no, as though that were the obvious answer, because the water needs to contact the skin. Likewise, the semen needs to be deposited inside a vagina for a marriage to count. This is an attitude that quite literally has a death toll attached to it. And yeah, there are treatments that make HIV manageable and lower the viral load to a point where it is impossible to spread as long as you're taking your medications, but not everyone has access to those treatments, so to argue against the use of condoms even within the confines of a marriage is not only fucking gross, it could be, and has been, downright deadly. 
Hundreds of thousands of people die from HIV-related illnesses every year, and condom use is one of the most effective methods at stopping HIV from spreading. So to be against it just means you want people to die. I'm infertile due to a congenital condition that cannot be treated or cured. Would it still be okay for me to take a husband and consummate marriage with him, even with this knowledge? Now, just think about how fucked up your religion is if you find yourself with adherents who feel the need to ask questions like that. Because of something completely outside of my control, am I allowed to have an experience that I want to have, and that many would agree is one of the most enjoyable experiences that a human can have? And the reason people feel the need to ask questions like that comes directly from the Catholic Church's opposition to same-sex marriage. If it can't make a baby, it doesn't count as a marriage. Which is why he said that the couple having sex have to at least be open to having a baby as a result. Because an infertile couple could still be open to getting pregnant if God miracles a baby into existence there, right? But that just brings me back to what I asked earlier about why God can be expected to perhaps miraculously allow a woman after a hysterectomy to get pregnant, but this all-powerful God can't be expected to do the same thing for a homosexual couple. It seems like it's less about openness to conception, and more like y'all are just bigots who don't want to be seen as bigots. Yes. According to paragraph 3 of Canon 1084 of the Code of Canon Law, sterility neither prohibits nor nullifies marriage. That said, Canon 1098 makes clear that those who willfully hide this from their spouse contract an invalid marriage. As long as you're open and honest, it's fine. That's some weird caveating. If you're hiding infertility from your partner, that potentially indicates some underlying issue with the relationship, but it doesn't invalidate the marriage. But now I'm picturing a Catholic couple where one of them dies, and before the life insurance pays out, a priest must first perform an investigation to make sure there wasn't any hidden infertility going on. Because if there was, that wasn't really their spouse, so their insurance money goes to the next person down on the list. I know that's not actually how it plays out, but that's the sort of ridiculous place you wind up if you actually take this shit seriously. Is divorce always wrong? Even if your spouse cheats? Even if your spouse is emotionally, verbally, financially, sexually, or physically abusive? This might end up being a hot take of mine, but divorce is never wrong. Divorce means that at least one person in that relationship no longer wishes to be in that relationship, and whatever the reason or scenario, I don't see the ending of that relationship as a morally bad thing. That is not to say that divorce should be done on a whim, especially when there are children involved, nor is this excusing some bad behavior that often happens during divorce proceedings, but ultimately, the way I see it, if I'm in a relationship with someone who at some point stops wanting to be in a relationship with me, I now don't want that relationship either. Why would you want to be stuck with someone who doesn't want you? Will I be hurt if that happens? Absolutely. But I would forever be doubtful of the feelings of a person who stayed with me after they told me they wanted to leave and I somehow talked them into not leaving, and that's not a situation I want to be in. Divorce is never a good thing, but it is sometimes the advisable thing. Strong disagree. Divorcing an abuser is a good thing. Divorcing a cheater is a good thing. Divorcing someone who makes you miserable is a good thing. Hell, I'd go so far as to say that, in isolation, divorce is nearly always a good thing. The relationship is broken down beyond repair, so rather than sticking around and making at least one of the people involved miserable, everyone is now free to pursue relationships that they find more fulfilling. Now, obviously, divorce proceedings can get messy and be bad for kids. That's why I specified in isolation. Though I'm not sure that I'd even call that bad. According to developmental psychologist Dr. Donna Matthews, short term, there are negative consequences for kids, but after a couple years, they adjust to the new family dynamic and do, on balance, just as well as kids from happy two-parent households. So there is no long-term benefit to suffering through a bad relationship in order to protect the kids. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says as much in paragraphs 2382 to 2386. Yeah, but why should anybody care what a bunch of supposedly celibate unmarried people say about marriage? Hey, these dusty old guys who never had a romantic relationship say that you should probably stay married even though you're miserable. But it's okay. Sometimes if you do things just right, maybe one of you won't have to feel guilty about it. In short, divorce is always immoral because it breaks up the family, traumatizes kids, and sets a bad example for society. But sometimes one party can be free of guilt because they did everything within their power to be faithful. In certain cases, the Catechism even says that it's permissible. Maybe, but that doesn't really fly with the fact that you just said the Catechism says it is always immoral. Are you saying that the Catholic Church permits immorality? I'm shocked. Shocked, I say! I am shocked. Shocked! Well, not that shocked. Is artificial birth control always sinful? It's never sinful. What should be considered sinful is forcing people to bring unwanted life into the world. 
Except replace sinful with immoral, because morality is a thing that exists, while sin is not. No, but in the way that you probably mean it, yes. As birth control per se, as a means to prevent conception, yes, it is almost always sinful because it presents an artificial means of separating the couple and diminishing the ends of the sexual act. You do realize that even between a Catholic couple that follows all of the Catholic rules and doesn't use birth control, the vast majority of times when they have sex, the sexual act will be one that is purely for their own pleasure and bonding, and not for making a baby, right? Hell, even in one of those massive families where the woman is seemingly always pregnant, do you think they aren't having sex while she is pregnant? Because you can't really be open to that sexual act resulting in another baby when there's already a baby in there, right? So even in those cases, the vast majority of sex is for fun, not procreation. Making babies is, somewhat counterintuitively, the secondary purpose of sex. Maybe even tertiary, depending on how you look at it. There may be practical reasons for this, but no moral ones. Morally, it is bad to bring a baby into the world that is unwanted. Every child should be a wanted child. So quite the contrary, the reasons for using contraceptives are actually more moral than practical. But even so, why would you oppose it on the grounds of practicality? Between myself and my partner, we have five kids. And let me tell you, that can get fucking expensive quick. Like, I'm not at the point where I'm worried about being able to feed them, but holy hell is feeding them not cheap. Patreon.com slash Vice Rhino. There's also a time investment. I have a limited amount of time and attention, and kids need attention. I am fortunate to be in a position where food insecurity isn't a looming issue, but I am in the minority here. In a family where one parent is making minimum wage and the other is a stay-at-home parent, having one kid is likely to cause them to struggle with food insecurity. So it would just be downright cruel to tell a couple that they are not allowed to use contraceptives. Oh, and also, we learned earlier, sex is a fundamental part of marriage, so not only can't you use contraceptives, you can't abstain either. And not just cruel to that couple, also cruel to whatever children they have that they can't afford to have. The reason I say no is because birth control can sometimes be taken for its secondary effects, such as treating acne, and certain drugs may have a secondary effect themselves of diminishing fertility. Okay, there you go. Loophole for Catholic women. Don't want to be a baby factory? Just say you have acne or period cramps or something and go on the pill for that. I mean, better yet, just stop being Catholic, but really, if finding out that they're an international child rape cabal hasn't made you leave by this point, I don't really see why something like wanting to be treated as a human being with human rights would make you want to leave now. This is an example of the law of double effect, cases in which you will something good, but a second unintended negative consequence occurs. In these cases, it's permissible. If the intention is not to prevent pregnancy, it just happens as a result of some other treatment, this is allowed. And that is how you wind up with the fucked up reasoning that has Catholic hospitals treating ectopic pregnancies by surgically removing the fallopian tube rather than with a safe and effective oral medication. Because, you know, that oral medication's purpose is to remove fetal tissue. But removing the fallopian tube containing the fetal tissue is A-OK, -okay because you're removing a fallopian tube to treat the ectopic pregnancy. The fact that a fetus is in there just happens to be a downstream bad consequence that is acceptable. Like, seriously, that's a thing that Catholic hospitals do, and they often do it without informing the patient of the safer and less intrusive treatment that is available at non-Catholic hospitals. It's gross. What's the difference between using artificial contraception, like condoms, and natural family planning? The difference is, condoms actually work. There's a misconception among Catholics sometimes that planning childbirth is immoral. There's nothing wrong with being prudent and planning out a family. You're just not allowed to use any sort of reliable or effective methods when doing that. The issue comes in how you do it. Having sex, but removing a key component of the sexual act, the openness to life, is problematic. No, it isn't. And I can't believe it's taken me this long to get here, but it's worth mentioning that an organization that lives off of extorting donations out of its members has a massive financial incentive to increase its membership by any means possible. And the easiest way to do that is to encourage members to have more babies. Because, really, Show this video to any non-Catholic, and they'll likely find it to be just as ridiculous as I do, because so much of what he's saying just relies on a bunch of old men who are supposed to be virgins telling people the proper way to engage in an activity that they have sworn to never engage in. But tell the people that already believe this nonsense that they're not allowed to do anything to stop themselves from having kids, resulting in a bunch of families that are too big, then you've increased the chances that some of the kids from that family will remain lifelong Catholics who continue to donate money. Every sperm is sacred. Every sperm is good. Choosing to abstain from sex for certain periods of time as to not get pregnant 
It's just virtuous and responsible. So when an asexual person wants to get married, it's an unholy abomination because sex is part of the marital union. But it's okay for a married couple to abstain if they're just not ready for kids yet? And what if the married couple just don't ever want kids? Is that forbidden by Catholicism? How does any of this make sense to anyone? Is flirting outside of marriage considered adultery? No. Adultery is adultery. Flirting is flirting. Is flirting acceptable? It depends on your relationship. That's going to be a different answer for everyone. Well, it really depends on what you mean by flirting and what you mean by outside of marriage. No, it doesn't, because adultery is when you do the sexy time with someone other than your spouse, not when you make the doe eyes with someone other than your spouse. Flirting can potentially lead to adultery, but they are two different things. Also, since I accused him of it earlier, may as well point out that I am being a bit reductionist here. Kissing, for instance, is well past the flirtation line, but is not sex. But in a monogamous relationship, would probably be considered a breach of trust. Is it adultery? Technically no, but that doesn't mean it's okay. Anyway, I'm just going to skip the rest of this one. Essentially, my response would boil down to whether or not something counts as cheating or adultery is up to the couple to decide. Different people have different boundaries. Sure, if you believe in the Catholic God, you believe that he's the one that's supposed to be setting the boundaries, and he's so prudish that doe eyes would surely cross them. But God doesn't actually exist, and even if he did, it would be really fucking weird that the all-powerful creator of the universe gets mad about you winking at the wrong person, even if your spouse is okay with it. Is masturbation always a mortal sin? Nope. It's just masturbation. When done in private or with a partner, it is not dangerous or harmful or problematic. It's just doing a thing that feels good and has some health benefits. Though, as with everything, moderation is key. No. But that's only because nothing is always a mortal sin. At this point, it is worth clarifying that Catholics do not hold to the idea that all sins are equal the way several Protestant denominations, particularly the evangelical ones, do. In Catholicism, a sin that is not a mortal sin is one from which you don't necessarily need to repent and ask forgiveness, and you can still go to heaven. The mortal sins are the ones that, if you die in an unrepentant state without seeking forgiveness, will send you to hell. So sometimes masturbation will condemn you to hell, but other times it's just a mild no-no. As I've talked about in other videos, in order for something to be a mortal sin, it must deal with grave matter, be done with full knowledge of the consequences of the action, and complete freedom of will. So masturbation hits one of those three criteria, unless you're weirdly obsessive about sex. In the case of masturbation, many people act out of compulsion as a result of abuse due to addiction or even after significant spiritual warfare. Eh, I get it. Sometimes after an intense prayer session, you just gotta jerk it. While the sin still deals with grave matter and is never a good thing, it may not always rise to the level of mortal sin. How petty does your god have to be that he would toss people into hell because he doesn't like that they touched themselves in a way that felt good? Throughout the Bible, we see people with multiple wives, even concubines. How does this square with marriage being between one man and one woman? It doesn't. The one man, one woman thing was something that didn't really show up until the New Testament, and even then it's a requirement for church leaders rather than a blanket command that is always how it should be. It doesn't. Oh hey, I got one right! Yay me! But it's a great question to understanding the nature of God and the nature of his unfolding revelation. His unfolding revelation is apologetic speak for we don't actually know why a God described as unchanging apparently changes his mind so frequently, so we'll say that it's just him playing the long game. Let's make two important points here. First, God never commands polygamy. He simply allows it. I don't command my kids to eat their Halloween candy. I simply allow it. If you allow something that you have the power to stop, then that means that you, at the very least tacitly, approve of that thing. And while I very much have a you-do-you -you attitude towards polyamory, as long as everyone is a consenting adult, go for it, polygamy has historically not been an everyone is a consenting adult institution. It's usually been about powerful men exerting their dominance and control over not just the women, but also less powerful men. So yeah, that practice could have done with a touch of feminism in history. A lot of suffering could have been prevented if God had been more concerned about all people being treated equally, rather than with the wearing of mixed fabrics and making sure that you sprinkled the dead bird's blood just right in the ceremony to cleanse a leper. These passages may rightly be called descriptive of the times rather than prescriptive of what God desires. And that's fair. 
Some atheists will attack the Bible for documenting immoral things, like David's raping of Bathsheba followed by his murdering of her husband to cover it up. This is an unfair attack. It's a story of a thing that happened, well, supposedly happened, not an approval of that thing. In fact, the Bible actually makes it clear that David was in the wrong in that story. So the proper way to attack that particular story is to point out the way God punished David for his crimes was to wait until Bathsheba gave birth and then slowly torture the baby to death over the course of a week. Nice God you got there. Second, and maybe more importantly, God's patience with this reveals his mercy, not only with our weakness, but for women. So him failing to outlaw polygamy right from the get-go, thus allowing the exploitation of women for thousands of years, was merciful towards women? Seems a bit backwards. Please explain. In their culture, you have to remember, an unmarried or widowed woman was vulnerable. There's a couple problems with that. First, it takes agency away from God. God created people, and God passed down the laws that they were to follow. He literally shaped their culture according to your view. So what you're saying is that he shaped their culture in a way that was inherently flawed because it treated half its members as essentially property. Second, just think about what you said. An unmarried or widowed woman was vulnerable. So instead of having one woman per man, as that is pretty close to the natural distribution of the sexes, you have a system where one man is hogging many women. So the death of one man can potentially result in dozens to hundreds of women being left in a vulnerable position where they will be social pariahs. At least in the one man, one woman system, the death of one man will only do that to his wife and potentially unwed daughters, which because of biological limitations are not likely to be too numerous. But in your system, if a man has six wives and they each have at least two daughters, one well-timed kick from a mule can leave 18 women destitute with their only hope being to quickly find some men to marry their daughters to, who will hopefully have the financial means to also provide for their mothers. And that's assuming the daughters are of marriage age. If it's a gaggle of toddlers, they're just fucked. And so it was the just thing to welcome women into your home and provide them children. No, the just thing would be to treat women as human beings with rights and dignity. Not sure why your God doesn't seem to understand that. I mean, he still doesn't to this day, and I can prove it. Just go ask a priest if a woman will ever be allowed to rise up the ranks in the church to become Pope one day. Any answer other than yes is an indication that they don't see men and women as equals. From the beginning, God created man and woman for each other, and so at no point in the Bible does he bless or encourage these types of unions. He allows them, but they're not ideal. He had the power to only allow the ideal, but I guess he just decided to let women live in subjugation for a few thousand years before eventually revealing to them that having rights is acceptable. Though not in any scripture, just through church meetings that have all the appearance of just being a bunch of merely human people getting together to decide things, and which decided to allow things that the culture had already been accepting of for quite a while first. The church will become more and more progressive as time goes on, but it will always lag behind culture, fighting to keep culture back, but inevitably failing to do so. I've been with the same woman for seven years, and I want to receive communion. We are not married. I am not supposed to receive until I am. Right? Can I safely assume by your description that you are sexually active with this woman? Probably, but not necessarily. See the earlier part of the video about romantic asexuals. But again, this just shows the pettiness of your deity. Leaving aside the weirdness that is communion, made all the weirder by the Catholic belief in the transfiguration, which is that the bread and wine you eat and drink literally become the flesh and blood of their god, taking communion from the realm of weird ritualistic faux cannibalism straight into, if this is true, it's actual ritualistic cannibalism. But leaving that aside, God says you can't have a bit of bread and a sip of wine because you didn't have a specific type of party before you started living together. I get that communion is actually supposed to be a time of contemplation contemplation where you ruminate on how shitty of a person you are and so can be thankful that God loves you anyway and that you're not supposed to actually take communion until you've dealt with whatever unrighteousness was in your life. But, and this might be the former Protestant showing through in me, that's supposed to be a private ordeal between you and God. The priest or minister isn't there to pass judgment on whether you have sufficiently repented to allow you to receive it. Depending on the church, you might get a dire warning of the consequences of taking communion without doing the serious contemplation and repentance thing first, but it's not for them to decide whether or not you are worthy. Obviously Catholics don't agree, but I think that the Protestant version, as nonsensical as it still is, is less nonsensical than the Catholic version. If so, you are correct that this present situation would not be conducive with receiving communion. But you have options. You could, first of all, choose to live chastely with one another. 
Simply living together is not a sin, and so if you live in a wholesome way after going to confession, there would be nothing preventing you from receiving communion. So, yeah, this reminds me of that time in high school when naive teenage me was in a class where the teacher asked who would consider living with someone without getting married first. I raised my hand, wondering what the issue is. Obviously, it's possible to live in the same house without having sex. And yes, adult me does realize just how fucked up it was that a teacher was asking children in their class about their future sexual plans. But yeah, no, this gave me flashbacks is what I'm saying. But of course, there's always the option of getting married, right? It's been seven years. Maybe it's time to make it official? Yeah, that's an option. But there are legitimate reasons why a couple might want to live together without getting married. And by legitimate reasons, I mean literally any reason. You don't have to actually get married, and that's fine. There might be reasons why you would want to get married that have nothing to do with the church or religion, but not wanting to get married is also fine. Help my partner and I have joked about traveling the world together and getting married in every country we visit, but never registering those marriages in Canada. Also, picturing the nightmare of our kids trying to sort through all the various countries' estate laws after we die is an added bonus. That's fucking hilarious. Gotta make sure we have a bank account at least a few of those countries, after all. Is contraception morally permissible if it prevents abortion? While it is certainly a noble desire to prevent an abortion, the logic doesn't necessarily follow here. It would if you had any sense of consistency whatsoever. If you actually considered abortion to be the murdering of a baby, then you should be all about encouraging the use of contraceptives for the people who would be inclined to have an abortion should they become pregnant. I've never heard anyone equate an egg not being fertilized with murder, but abortion gets equated with murder all the time. Surely, even if you are anti-contraception, preventing an actual murder would take a higher priority than that stance, would it not? So the fact that you are still willing to advocate for positions that will result in unwanted pregnancies, many of which will subsequently result in abortions, kind of shows your claim that abortion is murder to be a lie. Besides the fact that there is no reason one has to get an abortion if pregnancy isn't wanted, there are plenty of people for whom pregnancy is incredibly dangerous whether they want a baby or not. So fuck off with that nonsense. Also, bodily autonomy should be a thing. When restrictions are put on abortions, People die because doctors have to consider whether or not they will be putting their careers at risk should they perform an abortion. And even setting aside the situations where an abortion is medically necessary, like some types of miscarriage, having abortion bans is just bad for everyone. States with restrictive abortion bans are seeing OBGYNs leaving, resulting in more than one third of counties in the United States being considered maternity care deserts, which with that terminology might leave you thinking that they don't have enough doctors that specialize in maternity care, leading to longer wait times and whatnot. But no, these are counties that don't even have one single doctor, nurse, midwife, or medical center that specializes in maternity care. Not one. On top of that, states with abortion bans see fewer med school graduates applying for residencies there. And that's combined data for all specializations, not just OBGYNs. So banning abortion will lead to worse healthcare overall for everyone where it is banned, not just pregnancy-related healthcare. Catholic theology does not allow doing something bad to achieve a good. Yes, it does. You literally explained it yourself earlier in this very video. You just have this weird technicality to allow for a loophole where what you consider a bad result cannot be the direct intention of the action that results in it. What I'm saying is that everyone who wants birth control has bad acne and or period cramps. So the intention of the birth control is clearly just to mitigate those effects, not prevent pregnancy. And remember, we're dealing with a supposed all-powerful being here. You think God can't make a condom break if you really want a couple to have a baby, or nullify the effects of the pill, or do anything to counteract all the other birth control methods there are? If God really wants someone to have a baby, he can just do that. So why would the people who worship this God be worried about whether or not people use birth control? We know the answer. It's money. More Catholic babies means potentially more Catholic adults, which translates into more donations. And campaigning against all of the reasonable methods of family planning is the most blatant thing you could do to make your intentions obvious. I mean, I'm sure that people like Casey have been indoctrinated to a point where they actually do think that it's God's will or whatever. But whether the effect of increasing the believer base through controlling women's bodies is intentional or just the result of a sort of religious natural selection where only the religions that engage in that behavior are likely to survive long term is rather irrelevant. Regardless of the intentions, the real-world consequences are that you have fewer rights for half the population. For Catholics, the ends do not justify the means. You have to will good things by doing good things. Tell that to the survivors of the residential school system, which, and I cannot stress this enough, was still active in Canada until 1997. 
Every time the Catholic Church is put in a position of trust, it abuses that position. Every. Single. Time. And don't get me wrong, Protestant churches are nearly as bad. I brought up the residential schools. They were not exclusively Catholic. There were Anglican, Presbyterian, and United Church schools as well. And it was a program that was put together by the federal government. Though, importantly, all of the churches involved had issued official apologies well before the last residential school was even closed. The government also issued formal apologies, though those came a bit later. The Catholic Church did eventually give a sort of non-pology where they didn't actually apologize for what they did, but basically just said, sucks that it happened, and that didn't happen until 2021. So if we count that non-pology as an apology, the Catholic Church was the last institution involved in the schools to issue an apology. Well, not quite. We're still waiting on the British royal family, but I ain't holding my breath for that one. So I'm not singling out the Catholic Church and ignoring all the atrocities committed by other churches, as they so often accuse people of doing, but I am currently responding to a Catholic, so the Protestant issues aren't really relevant. And finally, are sexual thoughts or temptations considered sins? Woohoo! It's thought crime time! Yes, but not always. Jesus teaches clearly in the Gospel of Matthew that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Which is a really fucking gross teaching. It's not what you do that matters, it's what you think. And as someone with ADHD, my brain never shuts up, and I'm very often not in control of what it's thinking about at any given moment, so the idea that I could be thrown into hell because my brain works in the way that God designed my brain to work is terrifying. Good thing it's not true. This means that we must guard even our thoughts. That said, it's important to remember that we are not always in complete control of our thoughts, and we are certainly not in control of every feeling or attraction we experience. Oh, is he actually going to acknowledge how fucked up it is for people to be punished for thoughts and feelings that they don't necessarily control? Simply thinking or feeling something isn't a sin. The sin is the willful meditation on certain things and the failure to move to another thought when they come. I mean, after I come, there's no reason to continue thinking the sexy thoughts, so yeah. Oh, wait, that's not what he meant, is it? That's a problem. Which is not what you should do with this video, as you've gotten to the end and must have clearly liked it, and so I encourage you to share it with someone else, to rewatch it, and to ask your questions below. Yeah, no, making it to the end does not mean that you enjoyed it. Otherwise, I'd never make it through any of the videos that I'm responding to. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Harry McNipples, who says, Just a heads up, people don't really have preferred pronouns any more than we have preferred names. We just have our correct pronouns. The pithy quip response to this is to point out that someone's correct pronouns are indeed the ones that they prefer. But the wrongness goes deeper here, as we do have preferred names. How many people are named Jonathan but go by John, or Suzanne but go by Sue, or any number of other shortening variations? Well, apparently Jack is one of the shortened versions of Jonathan. How does that make any sense? And that's not even getting into things like nicknames or people who go by their middle name instead, or the fact that languages exist in which there are no gendered pronouns in the first place. Language, including names and pronouns, are a social construct. We made it up, we make the rules, and the rules change. There is no absolute linguistic standard by which we determine if something is correct. There are only arbitrary rules that have always been subject to change, and show no sign of ceasing their proclivity for change anytime soon. Thanks for watching. I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your Rhino fix in before then, I live stream with Cirrus every Wednesday, 8.30 Eastern on my other channel, The Watering Hole. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and sponsorships manager, Piper for being my editor, and special thanks as always to my patrons, who are the transfiguration that converts the bread and wine of my channel into flesh and blood. If you'd like to make it so that people who take communion are literal cannibals, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time! Double O seven. And <laughs> go back further. I'm going back further. We have to go back to the future. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being on Patreon with the manager.